As we look around today with all the people talking about the rapture, I even heard uh, Elon Musk talking about the rapture here a while back. And then there were some people saying that, uh, that he got saved and all this sort of thing. I, you know, I don't know about all these things that people uh, are saying and, and doing, but I do know God. And I do know that since I have walked with God, my life has been considerably better. So much. Yeah, so much, as my wife says. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, does, does that tell us when the rapture is going to happen? Will the rapture happen in this 2024? A few years ago, I remember I was driving a truck at the time, and they were talking about Y2K coming up because it was in the 90s. And a lot of people were filling the churches because they thought the end of the world was coming in 2000. Or the rapture was going to happen back then. And so they were having Bible studies everywhere I went. And there's another verse that deals with the rapture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means we ain't all going to be dead, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, See, that last trump is not Donald. He's talking about a trumpet here. Because he says, that trumpet shall sound. That last trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, that means Christ is coming back at the last, the sounding of the last trumpet. Did you, did you hear that with me? Yeah. As we read that, at the last trumpet. Now, after a little while, all those people that was filling the churches kind of got away from God again. And then here come that scary movie in uh, 2012 where they thought, oh my goodness, we missed all that back in 2000. Now it's going to get us here in 2012. And that movie scared a lot of people. Matter of fact, my oldest daughter came up from South Carolina because she was so scared it was going to be flooded down there and then that she was going to get drowned and stuff. So they was looking for a place to live up here in West Virginia. And some of y'all at the church remembers that. Well, she's living back in South Carolina again now. But after a little while, people got over that, I guess you could say. And now, what are they doing? Well, people seem to change all the time, but... God never changes. You know? He always... God is always concerned that He doesn't want any of us to perish, but that we all come to repentance. And so, during the times it was... These people were all talking about the rapture and, and stuff going on. These, a lot of these people had some sort of religion. But when you take a closer examination of them, how they were living their lives, and what their lifestyle was like, very few had a very righteous lifestyle. They had a load of sin in their life. Just about everybody you would talk to. And we had people come to this church and I would be preaching, and. Some of them say, oh, he don't live like that. He don't do what he's saying up there. He don't live the way he's saying and all that. But we do. Yes, we, do. we live the life like Christ would have us to live our lives. They couldn't sin because they were so far away from God. And yet, they were hoping for the rapture to happen so they could go up in the rapture. Now, 
people that are still loving the world more than they love God, their Creator. Is God going to take these people up in a rapture? Think about that for a minute. They don't want nothing to do with God, for the most part, but yet they're talking about going up in a rapture. Elon Musk, I remember seeing that thing they said about him. He said, well, if Jesus wants to save me, I'd be willing to let him save me. <laughs> I thought that was nice of him to say. No, he'd be willing to let Jesus save him. You know, <coughs> but today everyone is still talking about this rapture. And yet, the biggest portion of most of these people don't want nothing to do with God. Amen. <coughs> so why do they want to go up in a rapture? There's a fresh cough drop in there. Okay. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes, And for this cause, what cause? For this cause, God shall send these same people, he says, Strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Could it be that God has sent some lying doctrine here for people that are so gullible they want to think that they can live like hell and go to heaven? But in the meantime, These people are telling everyone they're a Christian and they're hoping that the Lord is going to come back and take them up in a rapture while they live in like hell. Is this even possible? Is God so hard up for people to go to His heaven that He's willing to take the devil up with Him? After all the trouble that the devil has caused God over the years? And he's finally going to do away with sin. And he's going to do away with the devil by putting him in a lake of burning fire and brimstone. Is he going to take people that are like the devil up into his heaven and go through this again and again and again? Maybe I'm looking at something in a different way. I don't know. What do you think? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then cometh sudden destruction upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They're sitting in their churches right now. It don't matter. I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. <laughs> I don't care what's happening in the rest of the world. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. I know I'm saved. I know Let's look at that verse again. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, and they shall not escape. Isn't it what they're saying in these churches right now? Because I know I'm going up in the rapture no matter what. Huh, I've got peace about it, and I know I'm saved. And yet they're living like hell. They got divorced preachers out there, they got women preaching. They got everybody that's doing direct, directly opposed to what the Word of God says. Do what? That's why I said what you just said. Yeah. They are in direct opposition to what the Word of God says. Amen. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, now I just read verse 11, but look at verse 10 here. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. You see, why are they perishing? What he was talking about in chapter 5 there, verse 3. Why are they perishing? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, verse 11, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Now that makes a lot more sense to you, doesn't it? So you know who's receiving this lie now. The ones in the churches. Those are the ones receiving this life. The world that doesn't have anything to do with God, most of them could care less. Oh, hell ain't going to be so bad. It'll be all right. I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. I look, look at the problems I've done already had in this life. You think I can't get through hell? Let me tell you something. That's what they'll tell you. They ain't a bit concerned. But when they lift 
lift up their eyes in hell like the rich men in Luke chapter 16 did, when they lift up their eyes in hell, what are they going to say then? Because there's no parole from it. There's no probation. And you can never end that sentence. So they therefore to count, so to speak. And these people in these churches think they're saved because some tickle their ears preacher told them a lie, sugar-coated the gospel, told them, well, just come to church when you can. If you don't have to work or if you've got something else to do, that's fine. Just come whenever you feel like you can get here. See, God has put a lying spirit in their mouths. And they're telling people <clears throat> all sorts of lies. But Jesus says, when the man found the pearl of great price in this certain field, he said he went out and he sold everything that he had so he could buy that field and obtain that pearl. <coughs> that means he had to give up everything. Now that doesn't sound nothing like what these itchy ear preachers are telling you, does it? They're telling you, if you feel like it, if you can, you know, it, uh, as long as you send your tithes in, that's all that matters. Just send us your money. Nothing else matters and we'll make sure you make it to heaven. Well, in 1 Kings, chapter 22, and verse 23, the Bible says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. You see, God says it right here in His Word that He has put a lying spirit in these false prophets' mouths. Now what's a false prophet? All these Christians out here that were claiming that Donald Trump was going to be the president again on that last re-election that he's jumping up and down and screaming about was stolen from him. They were saying God was going to make him that next president again. They prophesied this. They were lying prophets because it did not happen. And now they're pushing it to try to make it happen again. And why? Because the devil's behind it. That's why. They're liars. And they have no truth in them. And when they speak of the lie, they speak of their own. Because they're liars from the beginning like their father. Amen. Just look at all the evil going on in these churches today. And not just by the fallen pastors. But look at all the people who are so crazed over sin. They don't want anything to do with God. So why do they want to go up in some rapture when their lives are all about sex and money and pleasure? As we see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this know also. That's how we know this is the last days. The Bible said this is what's going to happen at the very end of time in the last days. He says, know this also, that in the last days, there's going to be perilous times are coming. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. You know what that natural affection is? Here you've got a mom that throws her baby in a trash dump, puts her baby in a dumpster. Here you've got a daddy raping his children. This is the kind of society we're living in today. You can't send your kids to school because you're afraid of what might happen to them waiting on the bus to come or what the school bus driver might do to them. We're living in a terribly fallen world and nobody wants to repent and come to Christ. And no matter what they've done, they can still repent and come to Christ and they can still be saved. And yet they're doing all these things and talking about going up in a rapture. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, hating, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And look at verse 5. Is this not talking about the church people having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof? He said for us to turn our back on these kind of people. Don't have anything to do with them. 
Because if you do, you're first going to tolerate their sin. Then you're going to end up embracing it and becoming just like them. So what does that tell you about the condition of the people? Does that sound to you like people who love God and are worthy of going to heaven? Does that sound like the kind of people you want to meet when you get to heaven? No. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14 says, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates of that city. And so yes, they are worthy. But what are they worthy of? Revelation chapter 16 verse 6. This is what they're worthy of. The Bible tells us. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. And thou hast given them blood to drink. For they are worthy. That's the way God sees them. They're worthy the way God sees them of this. And what does that mean for us today? Should we just continue like we have all of our lives? Or should we do as the world is doing? And as they're continuing to turn away from God, should we join them and turn away from God as well? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Is it even true or is it even real that God would have a secret rapture. You know, that to me, that kind of reminds me of that thing that was on TV. He said, shh, can we talk here? You know, doing something in a secret. Shh, don't let nobody hear what we're fixing to say, but I'm telling you. You know, that sounds shady. Would God be shady like that? No. And come off with some kind of a secret rapture? Now just think about that for a minute. That, that deals with their very, what these people are all about. It deals with their, something is not right, is it? When you have to go behind the back of everyone and do something in secret. That's just not right. And God is not going to do something like that. He's not going to, he told, <laughs> Abraham was sitting on the side of the hill one day. And the angel of the Lord went there before he we went into Sodom. And he said to Abraham, he said, you know what, I'm going down because some real messed up stuff has been coming to my ears from what's happening in Sodom. He said, but Abraham, since you're my child, you're one of my people, I'm not going to hide what I'm fixing to do in Sodom. I'm going to tell you what I'm fixing to, I'm going to do down there. And Abraham got all upset because of his brother Lot. Well, his, his brother's son, Lot, his relative, was living in Sodom. And he got to plea bargaining with God. And he said, well, if I said, what if we find 50 people? Will you destroy the city because of 50? And God said, no, I'll save it for the 50's sake. Well, he kept on until he got God all the way down to 10. And he figured, well, there's Lot and his wife, and they had two daughters and their husbands. And he said, well, hmm, ten, there, there should be at least ten righteous people. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters were six, and the two husbands, so that made eight. And then it didn't need to be but two more, <laughs> and they could have had children, so would thou destroy for ten? And God said, no. I wouldn't destroy it for the sake of ten either. But how many did God take out of Sodom? Think about that. How many people left Sodom? Well, there was Lot and his wife and his two daughters and one well, out. Wait a minute. His wife didn't quite make it all the way because she turned around and looked back. So actually, the only one that left Sodom was Lot and his two daughters. And the funny thing about it. You know, Lot, the Bible talks about him being a righteous man whose soul was vexed. But we read later that he's drunk, living in a cave somewhere with his two daughters. Yeah. And they had sex with him, and they got pregnant by their own dad. Where did he 
get the beer from or whatever it was he was drinking. I mean, right after God was destroying some, well, they was fleeing. So where was they going to get the beer, wine, or alcohol to drink where he could get drunk if he didn't do if he wasn't carrying it with him? That's just what it is. Like today, so many people going into the church and, and they carry all that worldly baggage with them. Lot carried his worldly baggage with him and went into that cave and got drunk. And look what happened. And how many people are in our churches today with their Santa Clauses and Easter bunnies and all the rest of this pagan garbage? Because they're carrying their worldly garbage along with them rather than leaving some. <coughs> they're bringing Sodom with them. Again, is God so hard up for people? He, he's going to let these people into His heaven in a secret rapture? It sounds too good to be true for somebody, maybe. All these morally weak people who think they can do anything and live any way they want, and they're going up in a secret rapture. It's asinine. Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. Jesus is speaking. He says, And why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But well, then what does he say, Marie? But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. <laughs> if you want to go to heaven, you've got to keep the commandments, Jesus said. Are you? Don't tell me you're going to church on Sunday and you're keeping God's commandments because you're breaking His Sabbath. I guess they think God is like they are. And He doesn't see what they're doing right before His eyes. In John chapter 14, verse 21, He says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. If you're keeping God's commandments, it shows, for one, you must love God. And you're going to see God work in your life, because he just said so right there. Why are people being healed in their prayers? Because they're breaking His commandments and they don't love Him. In fact, what we actually see is people looking for pleasure rather than looking for God. They're loving their pleasure rather than loving God and loving each other. They are unprepared. They are unrepentant for the return of Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slack or slow concerning His promise, as some men count slowness or slackness, but He is long-suffering so that none should perish, not wanting anybody to perish, but they all come to repentance. And then he goes on talking about the day of the Lord. What's the day of the Lord going to be like? Oh, it's going to be a glorious time when the rapture happens and we go up with Jesus. But the Bible says in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in a night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That ain't what you've been taught, though, is it? You've been taught something else, something that they put in here to tickle your ears and sugarcoat the Word of God. He says in verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what kind of persons you ought to be in all holy conversation, lifestyle, and goodness. 
looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's a word that they don't use in these churches today. They don't want to be righteous. I can have my sin and still be a Christian. Yeah, but are you a child of God? Anybody can say they're a Christian, but are they a child of God? We have to return to what the Bible tells us. Thus saith the Lord. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 8, we read a story about a parable, and he says it's a parable of, of ten virgins. In verse 8, And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Now oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, usually in the Bible. So they run out of the Holy Spirit in their life. <laughs> How did they run out of the Holy Spirit? Did God let the tank of Holy Spirit run low? And didn't fill them back up again? Or what happened? Verse 9, But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. In other words, you need to go back to the altar and pray some more. You need to get God to fill you with His Holy Spirit some more. You need some more of Jesus within you. Verse 10, Did they get Him? While they went to buy, while they was praying in their churches at the altars, the bridegroom came. What if the rapture happened this morning? And God only took up the ones that was in church this morning on that Sabbath morning. Where would the rest of them be? They went out to buy. He says afterwards. The bridegroom came and they that were ready went in to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterwards, oh, after the rapture, they came back to church on the Sabbath. Came the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Verse 12, Marie. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I don't even know you. <laughs> and you claim to be a Christian. But are you a child of God? Are you filled with His Holy Spirit? Or have you run out? <laughs> I ain't giving you part of my Holy Spirit. You know what the virgin says? You can't have mine. That uh -uh. you got to go and get your own. I seen a beta bumper sticker a while back that read, Drive like hell, you'll get there. When well, thinking about this message, I thought about that. I think it needs to be updated to at least a 2.0 so they can use it in today's churches. Live like hell, you'll get there. <laughs> well, maybe they don't want to hear that. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord says he's going to send his messenger before he comes. Think about that for a minute. A lot of people say that was John. John the Baptist and Jesus came. Some will say, oh, well, that was way back when. But what has that got to do with me today? Well, if we read on in Malachi chapter 3, down to verse 8, he says, will a man rob God? Are you robbing God today? Well, I don't even go to church. How could I be robbing God? Well, you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. How could you give a tithe and offering if you don't go to church? <laughs> you know what? The Bible says in verse 9, you are cursed 
with a curse. You have robbed me, even this whole nation. Robbing God, are you? You're not robbing good, you're robbing God. And what's going to happen? Oh, you're going up in a secret rapture. Oh, that's right, I know now. Mm -hmm. The greed is, if I leave the church, I only have to give part of my money to the church. And I can do with God's money pretty much what I want to do. Because I already said for Jesus to come into my heart. And, and if He wants to change me and He don't change me, then that's on Him. That ain't on me. I ain't got nothing to do with that. That's God's thing. <laughs> but Jesus said, when we just read the parable of the virgins, the ones that was ready went in. Didn't He say the ones that was ready? And those that didn't have enough oil in their lamp for Holy Spirit, they had to go out and look for some, but when they went to look for it, they were left behind, wasn't they? The rapture happened, and they were left behind? You know, people all seem to say or have some way to explain away their sin. But let me ask you, does God accept their sin? Or does God even like their sin? If it is sin. Think about it. Some people go right on like God never said anything. Like He don't even have His Word. Because the Bible said, let your women keep silence in the church for it's not permitted for them to speak. And yet we go to all these women preachers out here. So how can this be? Whoa. I think a woman ought to be able to do this and do that. But the Bible says again in 1 Timothy, let your women do what? Be silent. Think about it. You say no. There's not no idols in my life. And I'm not worshiping devils. And I'm not doing this. And I'm not doing that. Really? What about the Santa Claus and Easter money in your churches? What about the stock market or the bingo? Or what are you doing raising money for your church because the people in your church won't tithe enough to support it? Or are you just greedy? You need a new Mercedes. Oh, you play too much, spent too much money on the ball teams, gambling. The Donald's going to help you. I got his hat on. I'm parading around with a Donald head in my church. Well, old so-and-so, he's over there asleep. He ain't doing nothing. What are you looking at me about? Well, at least I'm not asleep in church. I got my Donald head on and I'm down here at Walmart. I'm going to join that MAGA movement. I'm not interested in making God great again. I'm interested in making America great. Where would God be without America, huh? <laughs> Did I get that right? Or where would America be without God, huh? Think about that. Has anybody ever told you what God said about women preachers? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches. It's not permitted to them to speak. They are commanded. Commanded? To be under obedience as also saith the law. Oh yeah, I know you've got something to say about that. But read verse 37 now. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are what? The commandments of the Lord. Commandments of the Lord? Yes. Jesus told us to go out and make disciples of all nations. How do you make disciples of all nations and you're teaching them to break all the commandments? God said to go to church on the Sabbath. God said to worship on the Sabbath. And you don't do that. God said, thou shalt not kill. You don't do that. You're killing your brother and your sister. God says not to have women preachers. And your pastors are woman preacher. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 11 please. 
Oh, you know, I thought you thought I just made that one verse up and, and pulled it up out of nowhere. First Timothy chapter two, verse eleven, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. How are you going to have a woman president when the Bible says in verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why? Read verse 13 and 14, please. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So how can you teach people the things of God when the teacher is doing contrary to what God says. I don't want to stand up and preach as a pastor of a church when the Bible plainly points out she's not supposed to do it. I can't understand that. That is so hard for me to see. I, I just... Yes. Oh, well, they was doing that sort of thing back... But this was written after they said that. The, you know... And then we look at these men. Not right with God. They've had three and four wives. Living in adultery. And 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 2 says a bishop or pastor or whatever. A leader of the church must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Now I don't know how a woman's going to get to be there. Because she's got to be the husband of one wife has to be vigilant, sober, that means can't be a drunk, and half the preachers are drunks, of good behavior, given to hospitality and apt to teach. Think about that. How can women be preachers? How can divorced men be preachers? Then ask yourself that. Because you have to be the husband of one wife. You know, these liars need to repent. They need to step down away from the pulpit because they're liars. And what's going to happen, they're going to die and stand before God and He's going to say, I don't even know you. Or the tribulation's going to happen before they die and they're going to go through pure hell here on this earth as they take the devil's mark. In Matthew chapter 28, Verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. How can they be a child of God? How can they be a preacher if they don't want to do what God says? The great commission that Jesus gave us, well, Jesus just didn't understand because we're going up in a secret rapture. <laughs> in John chapter 17 and verse 14 <clears throat> the Bible says I have given them thy word you see you don't have an excuse now has the world hated you because Jesus says and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world now ask yourself are you of the world or are you of God this morning are you doing what God says to do or are you doing something else? What category do you see yourself in? Are you doing as instructed or against God's instructions? You know, the people at church at Thessalonica that we talked about in the starting verses here were concerned that they had missed the rapture because Whatever people was talking about then, they was talking about a secret rapture then, I guess, of some sort. And Paul told them this. Turn with me to Thess 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 
I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering get together unto him. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is what God is telling me. This is what he says. This is what God is telling me. He said that you soon, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you, verse 3. Don't let anybody deceive you. The rapture isn't happened. It's not going to happen <clears throat> the way they're telling you. Don't let them deceive you, verse 3, by any means. For that day shall not come. The rapture shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Look at the empty pews in the churches now. <clears throat> and that man of sin be revealed. Okay, that first part's coming through trition. The churches are being emptied more and more today. But the second part has not happened because that man of sin has not been revealed. The son of perdition. Who opposes, verse 4, and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. There's a falling away going on right now. There are people who go to church today, but they don't support their church. And they, and they come when they feel like it. And they call themselves Christians. So ask yourself, what do you think God's going to do with these kind of people? Do you think He's going to take them up in some secret rapture? He said right there in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come until what? Except they're coming up, falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So then how can a secret rapture happen? Have you seen the, have you seen that man of sin revealed yet? Because it's not going to happen, he said, until you see that man of sin. And who is that man of sin? Well, if we read down in verse 4, what does he say there in verse 4, Marie? Who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And he said, don't you remember in verse 5, I told you all this stuff when I was with you? This isn't nothing new. This is something that has been going on. Everybody wants to put something in God's mouth that God didn't say. Amen. They want you to believe them and not believe the Word of God. And there it is written as plain as a hand in front of your face. Because this one that we all know as the beast or the Antichrist has got to sit in the temple of God and proclaim that he is God. But before he can sit in that temple and proclaim he's God, guess what? The Jewish people got to build a temple for him to sit in. Amen. And that temple hasn't even been built yet. <laughs> Why are you people so gullible? It's right here in the Word of God. Why don't you believe it? Secret rapture. And some people, oh, well, that's not, that, that's not when Christ, that, but that, that, that's not the same thing. You're talking about at the sounding of the last trumpet, right? You quote First Thessalonians chapter four at the sound of the last trumpet, right? But when you're talking about this rapture, this secret rapture happening, the first trumpet hasn't yet sounded, and you're saying you're going up in a rapture before the first trumpet sounded. And the Bible plainly says at the last trumpet. You know, at some point during this Antichrist persecution, Jesus is going to return and cut it short. And the rapture is going to happen at that point in time. I can assure you of that because we're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, he says, at the last trumpet. 
At that last trumpet you'll find in, is sounded in Revelation chapter 6 and again in Revelation chapter 16. And to look at it, God's telling us both of the places you're going to find the rapture happen both have sixes in them. Revelation 6 and Revelation 16. Yeah. Now, it's not going to be some fake blood moon as some of these fake pastors have said. This rapture is going to happen because God's wrath begins in Revelation chapter 16 verse 1. And as God's wrath is coming down, we're going up. Just like when Lot and his children left Sodom, they was leaving Sodom just as fire and brimstone was coming down. <laughs> Noah and his family was in the ark just as the rain began to fall. And just as God's wrath is coming down, His children are going up, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. Think about that. The rapture is going to happen, but it's not going to be like they've been telling you. It's going to happen just before God's wrath comes down. Jesus gave us an example of how it would be. And he said that the church was going to suffer persecution. Oh, well, a uh, Christian, you're not supposed to suffer for Christ. He did the suffering, so we don't have to. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, please. It's not appointed for us to have to go through persecution and wrath. Well, you... You tell that to the early Christians in. Verse 29, read it please. Wait a minute, Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. Okay. All right. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. If you think you're going to get out of this world with unscathed and nothing happened to you, I got news for you. You're going to go through something. The only way you will become real with God is for God to prove where you stand. And right now, these people can't prove to God nothing. They're living in sin. And that shows God exactly what they're doing. Matthew chapter 25. We read a while ago the parable of the ten virgins. <laughs> in verse 10 of Matthew 25 while they went to buy the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut you're going to be left behind and these pastors and these churches that have been all telling you about a secret rapture you're still going to be looking for it because you're believing them before you have believed the word of God and God says in Psalms of, hundred and nineteen and verse eighty nine, he says, Thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. In verse hundred and ten he says, Thy word is forever settled in heaven. You know what? Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. What are we going to do with that man called Jesus? So God is going to use this time of the tribulation that's going to come upon this whole earth for purging and purifying. He's going to separate those who claim to have faith from those who actually possess true faith. We have so many people today who claim to be a Christian. They don't have come to church. But God's going to give them a chance to prove themselves. 
They're going to have one chance to prove themselves when this tribulation begins. And that only chance that they're going to be given to prove themselves, they're going to have to have their heads cut off. Now let me ask you something this morning. You can't come to church. You can't believe in God today. How are you going to believe God enough to have your head cut off? You're going to have to get down on your knees at a guillotine and they're going to have to chop off your head. Are you going to say, go ahead and cut my head off because I believe in God? No. You're going to take the mark. You're going to hell because you're going to take the mark. Because you're too lazy today and you'll be too lazy tomorrow. You're going to take the mark. You're going to let the devil beat you down and plague you with all sorts of sicknesses and diseases in your whole life and you're going to end up taking the devil's mark before it's over and spend eternity in hell with the devil. Verse 10 up there in Matthew 25 says, those that were ready went in. What were the other ones doing? What were they doing in verse 5 in Matthew 25? While the bridegroom tarried. What were they doing? They all slumbered and slept. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus had looked into the churches and they was all asleep. It was not over here in the Word of God. They was asleep. Believers are promised deliverance before the day of God's wrath. Because God says we're not destined for wrath. We're destined for heaven. We're not going to go through His wrath. I don't mean we ain't going to go through some mess that the devil's going to put on us and what man's going to put on us, but we're definitely not going to go through God's wrath. If you're a believer, then you're promised deliverance before God's wrath. But if you're only a wannabe, or maybe you're a Christian, but ask yourself, Christian, are you a child of God? Have you been to Jesus? Amen. Don't tell me you asked Jesus to come into your heart because that's not what the Bible said. The Bible said that thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. Nowhere does it say ask Jesus to come into your heart. You've got to believe on Jesus. Nothing else is going to work. People in this world are going to have plenty to answer to God for. And in this pre-tribulation rapture, the sound of the last trumpet... <laughs> They claim that's when the rapture is going to happen. Well, that's when it's going to happen. But their rapture happens in birthday chapter 4. Come up hither. There hadn't been one trumpet sounded yet. No trumpets have been sounded yet. Let alone the last one. they got seven trumpets in front of them yet. And you're going to be here for six of them. Whether you're a child of God or whether you're of the world, you're going to be here for six of them. But when the seventh begins to sound, think about it. Where are you going to be when God calls His people home? Are you going home? In Revelation chapter 6, remember I told you about the sixes? In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 16, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They know it's God! And yet they're not repenting, are they? But fall on us and hide us. For the great day of His wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? They know it's God, but they ain't repenting, are they? <laughs> Think about that. In verse 12 of Revelation chapter 6. 
I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely fig when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled up together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Therefore they know who God is, but they're not repenting. I'm not going to church on the Sabbath. I'll go when I feel like I'm going to go. I'll come to church when I feel like. I'll do what I want to do. It ain't no God or nobody else going to tell me what to do. Want to bet? Somebody's going to tell you what to do in this life as well. In Revelation chapter 16 now. See, I told you about all the sixes in it. Verse 1. I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vows of the wrath of God upon the earth. Somewhere between chapter 11 and chapter 16, we're going up in a rapture and the wrath of God comes down in chapter 16. So somewhere between the end of chapter 11 in the beginning of chapter 16, we're going up. Revelation chapter 14, you're hearing a voice. And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So it hadn't happened then, is it? Because he's saying if you do that, you're going to get what's fixing to come. It is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Verse 12 now. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All right, I want to tell you this is what's fixing to happen, but right here are my people. That's what he said. This is what's fixing to happen, and here's my people. They're fixing to go work. They're right here, right now. Here they are, the ones that's keeping my commandments. Where are you at? That's what he's telling us. Here's my people, but where are you? Where are you going to be when they come for you? When we look at the arrival of the Lord, as I said a while ago, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, let no man deceive you. Remember? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a wall of falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. God's already told us all of it now. What are you going to do with God? That's the deal. What are you going to do with God? In Revelation 13, verse 4, they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast. You see that? And he says in verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth. That means all whose mind is on earth, the earthly things. They're so concerned about their ministry and how many people they got coming in their church. They're not a bit concerned about souls being saved. They're concerned about numbers. All those that dwell upon the earth. Verse 16 there, he says, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And this is the mark of the beast. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 
600, three score and six. In light of this teaching this morning, it is imperative, I think, that we prepare our hearts to be overcomers. Because what we have heard and what we have seen written in God's Word is soon to come to pass. And Jesus has warned us ahead of time that these things are going to happen. He says so in Mark, in Matthew 25, verse 25. Matthew 24, verse 25, He said, Behold, I have told you before. Now, I already told you what's fixing to happen. What are you going to do about it? We're going to close here in about two seconds. Two shakes of a lamb's tail, somebody said. <laughs> the Antichrist is going to arrive right when he is supposed to. He's going to do just what was prophesied of him doing. He's going to sit in the temple of, of God there in Jerusalem. They have to build it before he can sit in it. You're going to know who he is. And he's going to tell you, you take my mark or I'm going to cut your head off. That's going to be the end result. You take my mark or I'm going to cut your head off. But some of you have somehow persuaded yourself that none of this is going to befall you. Because you say you love God. But let me ask you, do you love the world more than you love God? God. Are you willing to give up your worldliness for God? In order to give up your worldliness, you've got to come to Jesus. And if he, if Jesus decides, well, you know what? I'm going to give you a million dollars. Take it. I'm going to give you fifty million dollars. Take it. It's not the money that's going to send you to hell. It's the love of the money. Amen. What are you going to do with that $50 million? Hide it? Put it in a bank and let it just sit there? Oh, I'm going to save it until I get old? <laughs> well, if I said that at 79 years old, I don't know how much older I'm going to get. <laughs> I better spend it while I got it. I won't get a chance to. But I ain't going to be around much longer. I'm going home. I'm going to be with my Lord. Where are you going to be? Are you going up in some secret rapture, you think? And what if you're here and you see the beast? And you say, you hear it come out of his mouth to take his mark. Are you going to be with the ones Jesus said was his? Here is the patience of my people. Here are they that keep my commandments. Or are you going to be out there with the world who ain't keeping his commandments? Who are you going to be with? You have to decide that this morning. You say, no, I don't. I ain't decided all my life. Why should I decide it now? Well, <clears throat> I guess you don't. Because no decision is the same as a decision for the beast. Because that's not a decision for Christ then, is it? So you think about it. Where are you going to be when the smoke clears? Where are you going to be when the tribulation begins? Where are you going to be when they say, oh, are you a Christian? Well, why do you ask? Well, because if you're a Christian, we're going to cut your head off. Why would you want to do that to me? I've been such a good fellow. I've supported you all along. I mean, look at this home I have. Look at my cars. And look at all the money I got. Why would I do something against you? Are you a Christian or not? Well, the way you're putting that don't sound like I am, does it? What are you going to do with this man called Jesus today? You're going to have to do something with him. What? Think about it. Come to Jesus today. Thank you. Amen.